Welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. If you like this video, please let me know by subscribing to the channel or visiting my website to become a member for more exclusive content. So in our practice, APOB is the most important metric that we are looking at to predict risk, uh, which is not the only marker that we look at, but it is the most important marker. All right. So Peter, you mentioned kind of in your practice, you look at APOB a lot. Um, just want to walk through what labs as it relates to cholesterol that you run with patients in your practice outside of what a typical cholesterol panel would show. Yeah. So we, we obviously do run the full lipid panel. And, and part of the reason for that is I always do want to see the non HDL cholesterol. Um, and I'll, I'll explain why in a second, but I'm obviously looking at LP little a at least once. Um, and if it's elevated, we might look at it again, depending on certain interventions. Um, uh, the ApoB, I also want to know ApoE, which is a genotype. ApoB, uh, of course, and ApoE are largely unrelated for the purpose of this. So, uh, you know, all of these things are basically telling me about <clears throat> risk, but they're not actually telling me how much, you know, atherosclerosis is currently present. So there's still things I want to be able to look at to understand how much atherosclerosis is currently present. But unfortunately, biomarkers aren't really great for that. Um, so the biomarkers are really helpful for predicting risk and they're manageable, right? So we can lower risk by reducing these biomarkers. So in addition to everything I just said, we also look at homocysteine, uric acid, of course, thyroid function, iron, ferritin, all of these other things factor into how we manage risk. Um, and those, again, that's just the biomarkers, right? We're still looking at metabolic health within biomarkers and non-biomarkers. We're looking at blood pressure. We're very aggressive in, in, in monitoring blood pressure, even slight elevations of blood pressure. We pay very close attention to, and we, we look to treat. Um, and that's not necessarily pharmacologically because a lot of this can be treated, um, you know, through other changes in behavior. Yeah. And you mentioned there the idea of predictor of risk, and I've heard you talk before about the difference between predictor of risk versus indicator of damage when it comes to this. Can you just walk people through at a high level just the difference there? Because it's subtle, but I think it's an important thing. Yeah. I mean, if you look at all the pathologic slides I showed you today, um, you know, those are clearly different levels of damage. And so the question is, how can we capture some of that? diagnostically because biomarkers aren't really going to tell you what we looked at in those pathologic slides of those six individuals or whatever that number was. Um, so here, I think the two most important things that we can look at are a calcium score, CAC and a CT angiogram. Um, and there's a, there's a difference between these, right? So a CAC or a CAC score is a score that's done by doing a very quick CT scan of the heart. Uh, without any intravenous contrast and just looking at the amount of calcification in the coronary arteries. So, you know, it's a very late disease process, right? Once you have calcium formation around coronary arteries, that's, the, that's really the second to last stage of atherosclerosis. It's a very late stage of healing. So it's a very advanced finding of disease. And it doesn't tell you much about what's happening at the point of calcification. So when, when I, you know, like just yesterday, I got a patient's calcium score back and it was not a very high number, but it wasn't zero. So that's already a big red flag to me. And, you know, it was at one part of their heart. And that doesn't really tell me anything. Like the fact that they have a score of, you know, whatever, 15 at one part of their left anterior descending, um, really means nothing about what's happening there, but that becomes now a real global alarm to me that given that person's age, which is early forties, um, if they have a calcified, if they have a calcified point right there, they undoubtedly have atherosclerosis elsewhere. The CT angiogram is a much better test, but of course it comes at a higher cost and it comes with more radiation though these days, if done really well at really good places. It should be in the ballpark of two millisieverts of radiation, which is a very small dose of radiation. That's about 4% of your annual allotted radiation, according to the NRC. Um, so that scan is a CT scan of the heart, but now with contrast, um, and this captures the calcification because they typically run a dry scan first to look for calcium, 
But then once the contrast is in, you now can see with great illumination the arteries and you get a better sense of not just luminal narrowing, but also the presence of soft plaque because of the resolution of the scanner if it's done really well. So really the CAC and the CTA, as the CT angiogram is called, are a very important thing that we use also in risk prediction, especially if the patient is themselves on the fence about uh, preventative measures. 